Daniel, chapter 5, Daniel. More narrative story here in chapter 5. And so I suppose we'll just read it and whatever cross-references pop up, they pop up. It, yeah, as well, we'll do chapter 6 as well. Have your Bibles out. Read along. Don't just take my word for it. Also, um, ideally, if you've been following along in the Daniel series, you've already read the entirety of Daniel. Asterisk. See, the entirety of Daniel is something that's... Uh, up for debate. What is the entirety of Daniel? Well, in the canonical Bible, we've got 12 chapters of Daniel. In the non-canonical texts, there are sometimes up to 14 chapters of Daniel. And then there are other works attributed to Daniel, or attributed to the time of Daniel, or attributed to those who compiled Daniel, depending on which biblical scholar you believe. So, Bell and the Dragon, B-E-L and the Dragon. Uh, cool little story that if you're on Patreon, I posted for you about a week ago. If you're not on Patreon, I'm encouraging you now. And I'm not saying you should support me on Patreon because I read the Bible. In fact, I I think once you introduce money into the Bible, things get really screwy. Um, so I'm not saying that you should support me on Patreon because I read the Bible. I'm saying that I use Patreon for communication with my supporters. And I posted Bell and the Dragon there, to be clear. Okay. That's why none of the Bible videos are monetized, etc., etc., etc. So there are other works that are attributed to Daniel, some of whom we may cross-reference here, including Bell and the Dragon. Now, Daniel 5, Daniel 6 is back into a narrative form, although the vast majority of Daniel is a narrative form. There is some prophecy in Daniel, but mostly it's narrative as a witness from Daniel, an exile of Judah, the Yahudim, the Jews, from Jerusalem into the Babylonian captivity. Thus far, Daniel has been witnessing to Nebuchadnezzar. And you may remember from last week, Daniel 4, uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, continues to have dreams. And he goes a little bit crazy. Remember we talked about that seven-year period that's unaccounted for in the historical documents of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. One of y'all asked me also in the comments, you said, in my copy of the scriptures, I have a 2009 scriptures, it says sovereign and you say king. Which version are you reading out of? I'm reading out of the 2009 scriptures. I just, when I see the word sovereign, I say king because I know that that's what that means and most people are going to be way more familiar with the word king than they are with the word sovereign. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so, Daniel 5. Belshazzar. Not Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, which is Daniel's name in Babylonian. Different Belshazzar. Belshazzar the sovereign. Belshazzar the king. This is not Daniel. This is a different Belshazzar. Okay? So this guy's name is Belshazzar. Daniel was named. Uh, let's see. We can find it in here. Dooby dooby doo. Hanayah, Mishael, Azariah. Belteshazzar was Daniel's name. Belteshazzar. Not Belshazzar, Belteshazzar. Right, very straightforward. So Belshazzar, not Belteshazzar, Daniel. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast 
for a thousand of his great men and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. So this is a giant party. While tasting the wine, Belshazzar, the king, gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, so now we know who Belshazzar is, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, who is acting like a wild beast in the field, based upon Daniel's previous interpretation of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, the son of the king, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Hekal, the temple which had been in Jerusalem, had been, because it's been destroyed, that the king and his great men, his wives and his concubines, could drink from them. So, giant party, they're getting ripped. And they're like, bring out the vessels from the temple of Yahuwah. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the Hekal, the temple of the house of Elah, of Yahuwah, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his great men, his wives and his concubines, drank out of them. Now, I must pause for a minute. I say Yahuwah. Other people say Yahweh. Other people say Yahava. Other people say Yehovah or Jehovah. Which one's correct? We don't know. I began saying Yahweh because that is the the English pronunciation of the yod heh vav -Hey. And then I had an elder brother who said Yahuwah, who says Yahuwah. And he was explaining to me that it symbolizes the breath of the vowels, Yahuwah. And if we think about Yahusha or Yahushua or Yeshua, again, same name. Joshua, his friends, Messiah, probably would have called him Josh, because that was his name. And also, there's no J in Hebrew, there's no J in Aramaic, and he was a Jewish guy in Matthew chapter 1. So, <clears throat> this elder brother pulled me aside and explained why he pronounces it that way, based upon his much learning in Hebrew and Paleo-Hebrew. I said, cool. And so I started trying on that pronunciation for size, and I like it. I'm not saying it's correct, but I like it. And here's the crux of the issue. No one can say definitively that it's correct because the name has been lost, because the Yehudim quit speaking the name while they were in exile because they didn't want the pagans to have the name of Yah. Of Yahuwah. Others will say it's disrespectful to use the name Yah. Y-A-H. Why would you call him that? Well, Isaiah calls him that. David calls him that. Others, other great men of Elohim in the Bible call him Yah. So, walking in their footsteps, I would say that if one has an intimate relationship with Yah, that it's okay to call him Yah, because others have. So, the reason I bring this up is there are certain among us that would like to make stumbling blocks out of the pronunciation of the name of Yah to the point where they will even say that you are in false worship for mispronouncing the name, to which I would say to them, what is the appropriate pronunciation? And I've had this conversation with people before, and if they know something I don't. I truly want to know. But typically, it comes back to some guy said this. And as I've always said, I'm less impressed with what some guy said than what the Bible says. Granted, I'm pronouncing the name based upon what some guy said. And I get that. I understand the apparent, uh, you know, hypocrisy in that. But I'm not saying that if you say it differently, you're in false worship. That's BS, if you ask me. That's a stumbling block because nobody knows. It's one of the things that will be revealed to us when Yeshua returns. In fact, in John chapter 17, I have an entire message on this from a men's retreat last year that I've, again, posted to Patreon on the regular. Yeshua prays for his apostles, for his men. And he says, I have revealed your name to them. 
but he doesn't say what the name is. And you can go very deep on that, on the revealing of the name, the yod Hey vav Hey, which dovetails into Matthew 22, verses uh, 36 through 40, which is, love Yah with everything that you've got, vav Hey, love your neighbor as yourself, yod Hey. And so, I would beseech you, brothers and sisters, don't make a stumbling block out of the pronunciation of the name of Yahuwah. That's damn near an abomination. Because if you're driving people away from belief and faith and accusing them of being in false worship as they do their best to walk in the ways of Yah, walk in the ways of Messiah, and you put a stumbling block in there that you made a sound with your mouth wrong, Therefore, you're in false worship. Well, you yourself cannot definitively say what the appropriate sound to make with your face is. Tell me that's not the tool of the enemy. So, I just figured I'd address that quickly. Verse 4. They drank wine and praised the Elohim of gold and of silver and of bronze and of iron and of wood and of stone. And so they were worshiping false gods while drinking out of the vessels of Yah. At that moment, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees locked, knocked against each other. So he starts to get a little anxious here. And the king called loudly to bring in the astrologers, the Kazdim, and the diviners, because they've had such a great track record at this point. <laughs> Although this is the king's son, functioning as king currently, so maybe he didn't have an understanding that the Kazdim were full of horse pucky. The king spoke and said to the wise ones of Babel, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation, boy, this sounds familiar, is robed in purple and has a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the reign. So I'll put you third in command. So all the king's wise ones came, but they were unable to read the writing or to make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belteshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his great men were puzzled. And the princess, the sovereigness, because of the words of the sovereign and his great men, came to the banquet hall. And the sovereigness, the princess, the queen, spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you, nor let your color change. There is a man in your reign in whom is the spirit of the set-apart Elohim. Again, the spirit of Yah is in Daniel prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. Imagine that. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the Elohim, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Kazdim, and diviners, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding, interpreting dreams, and explaining riddles, and solving difficult problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Imagine that. The king named him something akin to his own son. Mm. Now let Daniel be called, and let him show the interpretation. So Daniel was brought in before the king, Belteshazzar. I'm sorry, Belshazzar. Daniel is Belteshazzar. And the sovereign spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel, who is one of the sons of the exile from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the spirit of Elohim is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. And the wise ones, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they were unable to show the interpretation of the word. And I myself have heard of you, that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the writing and make known its interpretation to me, you are robed in purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. 
I get in my mind, this purple robe and this gold chain is like, it's almost like the king to me is like, I'm going to dress you like a pimp. Like all this like external symbolism of wealth. Like who, myself personally, who cares? Who cares? Old Carhartt jacket before they went gay. Hoodie from my friends at SOE. $10 toboggan hat. Dirty old lager boots on. Can I afford better? Yeah, but to find better. All of these things are highly functional. They keep me warm. They keep me clean. They keep me dry. I don't need a purple robe. Robe. I don't need gold chains. Like, I'm good. And I can only imagine Daniel probably being like, eh, meh, meh. I mean, hopefully he's saying, meh, whatever. And Daniel responds. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. I'm good, bro. I don't need the pimp suit. I, I'm good. Yet I shall read, I don't need the pimp suit, but I will read the words. Yet I shall read the writing to the king and make known the interpretation to him. O king, the most high Allah, Yahuwah, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a reign and greatness and preciousness and esteem. So your kingdom comes from Elohim, is the point he's making. And because of the greatness which he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished he killed, and whomever he wished he kept alive, and whomever he wished he raised up, and whomever he wished he made low. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was so strong as to act proudly, he was put down from his throne of reign, and they took his preciousness from him. Now, you're, you're Daniel. And you're in the midst of a thousand people. And you're saying this to the acting king, the son of the previous king. Hey, the reason you have a kingdom is because of Elohim. And you might think you're operating on your authority, but you're abs actually operating on his authority. Then he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. Like... Nebuchadnezzar himself has been exiled to the wilderness to act like a wild animal during this period, which is why Belshazzar, his son, is sitting on the throne in the first place. Daniel's given him a little bit of context. As these dudes are getting rip and drunk on wine that they're drinking from the vessels of the house of Yah. Like, pointing out the sin here is what Daniel's doing. He's like, mm, let me just give you a little bit of uh, context here. So, you, so that you're aware of what you're doing. He, Nebuchadnezzar, was given grass to eat like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of the heavens, till he knew that the Most High Allah is ruler of the reign of men, and he, Elohim, sets up over it whomever he wishes. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. And you have lifted yourself. So he's rebuking the king in front of a thousand of the king's homies. Boldness. Remember we talked about the characteristics of Daniel. And you have lifted yourself up against the master of the heavens and have brought before you the vessels of his house. You and your great men, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the Elohim of silver and of gold and of bronze and iron and wood and of stone, which neither see nor hear nor know. But the Elah who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not made great. So Daniel's recounting to him what they've been doing. Now we assume that Daniel wasn't in the room here because the princess had to send to go get him. Now maybe he heard. Maybe he got a little sit rep on the way in. Hey Daniel, listen, here's what's going on. We're partying in the great room. We're drinking wine. They brought out the vessels from the house of Yahweh. You know, your God. Um, and, uh, while they were drinking out of them, they were making offerings and praising, uh, the gods of silver and of gold and of wood and of stone and of iron. And Daniel probably is fuming at this point. And then they're like, and then some crazy stuff happened. And Daniel's probably thinking, yeah, of course some crazy stuff happened. Cause Yah's not happy. Like, your daddy just got exiled to the wilderness because he wouldn't humble himself. And now here you are acting a fool. Verse 24. Then the part of the hand was sent from him, from Yahuwah, 
and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, upsharit, upharsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, Ella has numbered your reign and put it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and been found lacking. Perez, your reign has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar, the king, gave orders, and they robed Daniel in purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, even though Daniel said he didn't want it. I'm good on the pimp suit. Don't need it. They still gave Daniel the pimp suit. And they proclaimed concerning him that he is the third ruler in the reign. And in that night, Belshazzar, king of the Kazdim, was killed. And Dariawesh, the Mede, remember we talked about the Mede of Persian Empire? The Mede took over the reign, being about 62 years old. So, Daniel's interpretation of the handwriting on the wall comes to pass yet again. One more witness that Yah is with Daniel. Daniel's not some crazy person just throwing theories out there, seeing what sticks to the wall. What he says is the word of Yah. In the midst of the king and all of his pagan homies, he's still speaking the word of Yah. Let's do six. Six here has a reference, or could be a reference to Bell and the Dragon, although it is not actually. Spoiler alert. This passage here is not actually a reference to Bell and the Dragon. And what's fascinating about Bell and the Dragon is that it also ties in the minor prophet Habakkuk, or Habakkuk who is one of my favorites, whom we will be reading, I don't know, 20 pages or so from now, be it Yas will. It pleased Dariawesh to appoint over the reign 120 viceroys to be over all the reign. So he established governors, essentially. And over them, three governors, so three chiefs over the 120 viceroys, of whom Daniel was one so that these viceroys should give account to them, and the king suffer no loss. So he put up managers, these viceroys. Think of like mayors or um, county commissioners. And then over them, 40 per, we're assuming if they're split up evenly, underneath the governors. And so the governors would manage a much wider swath of territory than the viceroys would. The viceroys would manage uh, these little more local areas and deal with the tactical day-to-day. -day. The governors would deal with the strategic, long-term, and then they would bring that to the king. Captains of tens, hundreds, and thousands. Right? It's a biblical concept. Then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the viceroys because an excellent spirit was in him. Interesting. And the sovereign, the king, planned to appoint him over all the reign. He's like, man, this guy's doing such a good job. We'll just, similar to the concept of Joseph in the end of Genesis. Dude, this Hebrew guy, he's so good at this stuff. We'll just let him run the country. And he'll be second only to Pharaoh or second only to the king. And the king planned to appoint him over all the reign. Then the governors and viceroys sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the reign. So the rest of these dudes weren't happy about it. The remaining governors and the 120 viceroys didn't want this yet exile of the Yehudim. Not, he's not Babylonian. He's not Kazdim. He's not Persian. He's a Jew. They don't want this guy running the country. So they're like, let's conspire to do evil against Daniel. But they were unable to find occasion or corruption because he, Daniel, was steadfast, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. That in of itself is a witness to what a man of Elohim should operate like. Because Daniel's in the midst of it. He's in Babylon. He's in the palace. He's in the inner circles of the king. And he's still steadfast. No corruption. No negligence. Steadfast. Excellent character witness for Daniel. 
Then these men said, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his Elah. The law of his Elah. Oh, Daniel kept Torah. Interesting. Daniel kept Torah, and even in the midst of this Babylonian exile, he's still richly blessed. Hmm. Huh. Almost like Deuteronomy 28 is real. Then these governors and viceroys tumultuously gathered before the king and said to him, King Darayawesh, live forever. All the governors of the reign, the nobles and the viceroys, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal decree and to make a strong interdict that whoever petitions any Allah or man for 30 days, except you, O king, is thrown into the den of lions. So anybody over the next 30 days who prays to anybody other than who the king says will be thrown into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the writing so that it is not to be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not pass away. (sighs) So they want the king to make a law that says, essentially, if Daniel prays to Elohim that he's in violation of this law, he gets thrown in the lion's den. Now, deeper than this is the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not pass away. This is man-made law, and these heathen dumbasses are smart enough to know that if the king establishes a law, it does not pass away. Let me repeat that. If the king establishes a law, it does not pass away. Now, for the no king but Jesus crowd, agreed, because... Messiah, Yeshua, is the Word made flesh. Right? John chapter 1. What's the Word? How many times have we had to go over this in our Bible study over the last five years? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. So if the Word is God, Yeshua is God. And God says in Malachi 3, verse 6, I'm the Lord, Yahuwah Sabaoth, I change not. I do not change. Could the king, Mashiach, king of kings, lord of lords, Revelation 19 imagery, change what God said if God doesn't change? No. No, he couldn't. Not if he's to be a biblical Messiah. Now, you can make him say whatever you want if you take his words out of context, like Big C Christianity does. But if you just read the Bible, which is why the churches today don't just read the Bible, they have Bible studies where they pick and choose our new series over the next 12 weeks. We're going to work through the book of Daniel. And they don't read the whole book of Daniel. We're going to work through the book of Matthew. And they don't read Matthew 5, 17, Matthew 7, 21. Or they work through the book of John. John's a dangerous one to do. It, they're all dangerous, but it's John is a dangerous one to do in Big C Christianity. If you love me, keep my commands as I have kept my father's commands. Whoa. Or Matthew, depart from me, you who do lawlessness. I never knew you. If you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Yeah. See, so they can cherry pick their way through this series over the next 12 weeks of studying the Bible rather than just reading what it says. And if you just read what it says, you can't have a biblical Messiah that destroys the Father's word, the Father's law, because he is the Father's word, the Father's law. And it does not pass away until heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle shall fall from this Torah till all be done. Matthew 5, 17. And then some will make the argument. Well, it, it all has been done. It's been accomplished. The, the resurrection, it's been accomplished. Therefore, it's done away with. Question, since we're now cherry picking Messiah's words, is heaven and earth still here? Until heaven and earth pass away. Now, I've never been to heaven that I know of. 
but I'm on Earth right now, and it's still here. Very easy litmus test. Yeah, but Paul said, no, nah, Paul, nah, we're in a rabbit hole. Don't worry, we're climbing back out. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees from his own mouth. He testifies in front of the leadership of the Romans that he's never broken Torah and he holds himself blameless. He's never knowingly broken Torah and he holds himself blameless but before men and Elohim always. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was had his doctorate in Torah, raised at the feet of Gamaliel, could recite every chapter and verse of the Torah from memory in context and tell you what it means. <clears throat> so when you read the words of Paul in the New Testament, which, by the way, do the words of Paul supersede the words of Yah? No. Do the words of Paul supersede the words of Messiah? No. No, they do not. But wait a minute. I thought the Bible was entirely divinely inspired scripture. And Bear, you're always talking about the doctrine of inerrancy codified in 1977. Yes. Which means if you have a problem with what Paul is saying, the problem is with you, not with Paul and not with the Bible. And how can I say that so confidently? Because I've been one of those people until you realize that Shaul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul teaches Torah on a doctorate level in the New Testament. And if you don't know what he's referring to, you don't know the Torah, you're completely lost. Completely lost. And so when you read Romans, when you read Galatians, when you read Ephesians without any context at all of what it is that Paul's talking about, completely unaware of the fact that in some points, Paul is talking about five to seven different Torahs, laws, instructions at the same time. The Torah of man, the Torah of flesh, the Torah of Elohim, the Torah of the curse of death, which the wages of sin are death and sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3 verse 4. You have no point of reference for this. You're trying to do land nav in the dark with a bad compass and no maps and you don't know land nav because you never went through the basic course. You're trying to navigate by the stars in the middle of the night on a cloudy day while it's raining and nobody ever taught you the basics. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So, Mashiach is the word made flesh. What is the word? What does Yah call the Ten Commandments when he passes them to Moshe, to Moses? The word. The word made flesh. In Messiah there's no sin. What's sin? It's lawlessness. Messiah never broke the Torah. Messiah never broke the Torah. There's no sin in him. And he paid for your sin, your lawlessness, your Torahlessness. Shall we sin all the more? New Testament definition of sin. All who, did, who do sin do lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The Apostle John, 1 John 3 verse 4. Shall we be lawless all the more so that grace may abound? In the words of Paul, no. God forbid you continue to be lawless, even though you believe in Messiah which goes into Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the endurance of the saints, those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, and keep the commands. Both. There's no comma in that. It's not two separate people groups in end times. It's one people group that have two belief structures, part of which is at the beginning of this book, and the second part of which is at the end of this book, and they're both the same book about the same guy. Literally the first word in the Bible, Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Bereshit, if you break down the Hebrew word Bereshit, it's a prophecy of Messiah. That a son will be born and he will be crowned with a crown of thorns and that he will suffer and die to atone for sins. That's what the Hebrew Bereshit means. It's the first word in the Bible. So, these heathens from Babylon understand. I'm bringing it back around. We're climbing back out of the rabbit hole. These heathens 
understand that the laws of the Medes and the Persians do not pass away. Their man-made laws do not pass away. But these Christians today preach that the law, the word of Elohim, has passed away. I can argue that one all day with nothing more than a Bible and a cup of coffee. It's doctrinal BS. It's not biblical. And it's false teaching. And proof text on that is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The lawless one is the Antichrist. And literally, Paul, Shaul of Tarsus says, that the working of lawlessness, the working of not keeping the Torah, is the working of Satan in the New Testament from the hand of Paul. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go read it. So these dudes, back to Daniel, understand that the law of the king does not pass away. Bro, implications for us. Who's the king? Does his law pass away? Not until heaven and earth passes away. And even then, if you say, well, in Revelation, then we won't have to do that stuff. Read Revelation. We've read every word of Revelation on camera together. It's in the New Testament playlist here on this channel. If we're not doing the law, why is Yeshua a high priest? Why are there Levites? Why is there a temple? Why are there sacrifices and burnt offerings? Hmm. Hmm. Sin cannot exist in the presence of the Father, right? That's why you have an intercessor, the atoning sacrifice of Messiah in the first place. Sin can't exist in the presence of the Father. In Revelation, at the end, we're in the presence of the Father. What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3, verse 4. In other words, even when heaven and earth pass away, in the millennial reign, and then the eternal kingdom, we're still doing Torah. Because not doing Torah is sin. Well, that sounds like workspace theology, Bear. Behold, I come swiftly to reward each man according to his works. Mouth of Messiah, Revelation 22, verse 14. According to his works. Even a child is known by their works. Mouth of Messiah. If you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Matthew 19, 17. Messiah. John 15, verse 10. If you love me, keep my commands as I, Messiah, have kept my Father's commands. Torah. Because in him there is no sin. So, now that I've beat that dead horse for ten minutes. Now, O king, establish the interdict. Verse 8. And sign the writing so that it is not to be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not pass away. So King Dariyawesh signed the written interdict. And Daniel, when he knew that the writing was signed, went home to his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. And he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before Allah as he had done before. So Daniel knows. And he's like, cool story, bro. I'm going to continue to worship the way I see fit. Then these men, the viceroys and the governors, tumultuously gathered and found Daniel praying and entreating before his Allah. And they approached the king, and they spoke concerning the king's interdict. Have you not signed an interdict that every man who petitions any Allah or man within 30 days except you, O king, is thrown into the lion's den? The king answered and said, The word is certain according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not pass away. <clears throat> then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the sons of the exiles from Judah, pays no heed to you, O king, nor to the interdict that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king realizes he's been set up. And now he's trying to figure out a way to get Daniel out of this. Then these men tumultuously gathered. So three times they've tumultuously gathered. They're causing a bit of an uproar here. Then these men tumultuously gathered before the king and said to the king, verse 13, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that any interdict or decree which has been established is not to be changed. Ooh. 
Then the king gave orders, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. But the king spoke to Daniel and said, Your Allah, whom you serve continually, he himself delivers you. So, Dariyawesh here may be realizing I messed up. Now, i got to let my yes be yes on this. I can't lose face on this. I'm the king. But you serve the God. Not a God. The God. And he will take care of you. <clears throat> and a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signets of his great men that the situation concerning Daniel might not be changed. And the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. So the king is quite anxious, quite concerned about what's going to happen here. Even if from a physical standpoint, not a spiritual standpoint, this guy Daniel's gifted. I was going to make him number two in the reign. He knows what he's doing. He's a good leader. He's good for the kingdom. But now i got to lock him in here with a bunch of hungry lions. Yeah, he's probably got heartburn. He's got anxiety. <clears throat> he's not sleeping. He's not eating. So clearly, the physical manifestation of anxiety here. Then the king rose up very early in the morning and hurried to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he called with a grieved voice to Daniel. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living Allah, has your Allah, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Now, this is the same greeting, the same supplication, if you will, that the princess gave to the king earlier today, or earlier uh, in the previous chapter. It's the same thing that the Kazdim have said to Nebuchadnezzar over and over. So I would like to think personally in context here, Daniel doesn't actually want this guy to live forever. And like, Daniel does not appear to be a respecter of men. And that's a good thing. Again, pattern for men of Elohim. But that's the greeting that they use. O king, live forever. My Allah has sent his messenger and has shut the lion's mouth. And they did not harm me, because I was found innocent before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was very glad, and gave orders that Daniel be taken up out of the den. And Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no harm was found on him, because he trusted in his Allah. And the standard, you know, Sunday school version of this is Daniel believed in God, and God saved him. And you can absolutely boil it down to that. And much hay has been made about the faith of Daniel in the face of adversity and how he was delivered from this opportunity that would have taken his life because of his belief in Elohim. And that is absolutely something that we should be aware of here, even if it's a very basic concept. And I'm not going to opine for the next 30 minutes on how deep your faith needs to be when you find yourself in the lion's den. Let's say your typical preacher stuff. <sighs> but it does illustrate there ain't a thing on this earth that is not within the purview of Elohim. Not one thing. And so if you find yourself in the den of the lions, pray. Believe. And belief is what you do, not what you say you do. It's not what you think. It's not even what you pray about. Belief is what you do. James, Jacob, the brother of Yeshua. And the king gave orders, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. So all the viceroys and governors brought them, and threw them, and their children, and their wives, into the den of the lions. Mmm. There's something to this. This is Torah. Do not bring a false accusation. Now, the wives and children, that's not Torah. But the men, that's Torah. If you bear false witness and the judgment that the person you were bearing false witness against because you bore false witness, that judgment is now meted out on you little check and a balance in the Torah to be careful how you run your mouth. And so these guys got it. But they, they got even more because their whole bloodline 
was wiped out. Similar to Korra, the rebellion of Korra, where Korra comes against Moshe and Aaron and says, hey, I'm the guy. I want to be the guy. And Yah's like, cool story, bro. And he swallows up, the earth opens and swallows up their tents and their whole bloodlines are erased. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they reached the floor of the den. So they were instantly just attacked. Then King Dara Yawesh wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, Peace be increased to you. From before me is made a decree that throughout every rule of my reign, men are to tremble and fear before the Elah of Daniel. For he, Elohim, is the living Elah and steadfast forever. And his reign is one which is not destroyed and his rule is unto the end. Now this is the same king who was getting hammered drinking wine out of Elohim's cups from the temple just a short while ago. Now, and who is not humbled, who is now humbling himself. And his reign, Elohim's reign, is one which is not destroyed, and his rule is unto the end. Now this goes back to, remember, the stone cut without hands that we discussed in a previous Daniel chapter. The stone cut without hands, which destroys all of these kingdoms and reigns forever. He, Elohim, delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, for he has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And this Daniel prospered in the reign of Dariawesh and in the reign of Koresh the Persian. Now, Koresh is coming next. I had a little bit of uh, political instability in this reign. So that's Daniel 5 and 6. Now, I asked y'all to read all of Daniel. And I told you that all of Daniel is, uh, depends, right? And so look for the non-canonical texts of Daniel, or you could even Google or search the extra books of Daniel. And one of them that you'll find <coughs> is Daniel, uh, Bell and the Dragon. Another one, uh, is, um, Susanna. Let's see. I'm reading from an article at Cielo.org. S-C-I-E-L-O dot org. There are two Greek versions of Bell and the Dragon. The oldest version, dating from 1000 BCE. It's often called the Old Greek. The second is the Theodosian version. Not only is it considered to be the younger version, dating from the 2nd century, but also the more elaborate one. Both versions consist of 42 verses. In the first episode of Bell and the Dragon, the character Daniel uncovers the deceit of the priests of the god Bell. Bell's temple is proven to be a space of fraud and lies, and Bell himself is proven a false and not living deity. I call this episode the disembowelment of Bell. The second episode, verses 23 through 27, demonstrate that the character Daniel is a slayer of dragons. I therefore call the second episode Daniel the Dragon Slayer. Yada, 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 yada. So, Daniel, in short, slays an actual dragon, and as a result, is thrown into the lion's den. Not this Daniel 6 in the lion's den. This Daniel 14, Bell and the Dragon, which is not in the canonical texts. Second time he goes into the lion's den. <clears throat> Let's see. The interesting thing about this... And how do we know these are two separate incidents? Because in Daniel 14, a.k.a. Bell and the Dragon, the way that the lions don't eat Daniel in Daniel 14 is that potted meat, potted meat, is delivered by an angel. Well, Habakkuk, the minor prophet, is grabbed up by the hair while he's potting meat, holding a pot of meat, and the angel grabs him up by the hair and flies him to the lion's den and drops the meat in there. And then takes him and sets him up on a mountain. And up on that mountain is where Habakkuk 
has his vision that is recorded here in the canonical text of the Bible and the Minor Prophets, the book of Habakkuk or Habakkuk, which is only three chapters, which we will read when we get to it, about 20 pages from now. So it's a cool little tie-in, and it also illustrates that there's more Daniel than the Daniel that we think we have. <clears throat> so I would recommend that as you're reading Daniel, that you go and find those extra-biblical, non-canonical texts as well, because this is one of the books, Daniel is one of the books that clearly illustrates that there are some things that are left in and some things that are left out. Why are they left out? Well, in many cases, it was to appease a political agenda. The church, that, which at the time was the Roman Catholic Church, and then later um, with uh, King James, didn't want these things in there, and so they pulled them out. Or they very intentionally changed verses, changed names. Why is Jacob called James in the New Testament? King James wanted his name in the Bible. Do you even ego, bro? There was nobody running around first century Judea named James. I promise you that. His name was Jacob, Jacob. So sometimes it's for political reasons. Other times it's because the veracity and historicity of the texts is lacking. And so, for example, Daniel, the vast majority of the manuscripts of Daniel would have 12 chapters in them. And so because the vast majority of the manuscripts had 12 chapters in them, not 14 chapters or 18 chapters or 22 chapters of Daniel, because the vast majority of texts had 12 chapters, that's what is ultimately translated and continued to be copied by first the scribes and then later the people who print Bibles over the years. And so then it becomes commonly accepted that there's 12 chapters in Daniel, even though there are other works attributed to Daniel or to the period of Daniel or about the period of Daniel that would otherwise be lumped in as Daniel. And so... It's worth doing the extra homework on this to not just read the entirety of Daniel, but to read the extra biblical non-canonical texts that are also attributed to Daniel for context with what we're reading here. And then in some cases, why are they omitted? Does the church really want to admit that there was a, a false god named Bel and it inhabited a dragon and there was a dragon and Daniel killed a dragon. Because now we're starting to get into like, for some reason, it's believable that Elohim is the king of the heavens and the earth. And why? That's faith. And we can see that. And we experience that, his sovereignty every day, right? But I've never seen a dragon. And was it a dragon dragon or was it a crocodile? Like, what was it? I don't know. They called it a dragon. And so frame of reference for some of these things is very hard to accept, and therefore they're not included. Even though we've got myriad stories, not just of David and Goliath, but of the sons of the Anakim that are up on uh, the Mount of Hebron, and the giants, the, the great giants, and the Iliad, and the Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6. And I've never seen a giant either, but we have lots of stories about giants in the Bible. In fact, there's two Goliaths in the Bible. Did you know that? And the second Goliath has multiple sons, and they all get killed by David's mighty men, which is why you should read the Bible with your own eyeballs, all of it from the first page to the last page. So in some instances, things like that are omitted from the Holy Scriptures, the 66 uh, canonical text, or what they call the Deuterocanon, because it's just, there's no frame of reference for it. And then Daniel killed a dragon. He did all this stuff, and then he killed a dragon. That sounds a little unbelievable. We're not going to put that in the book. And I'm not saying that that's the right thing or the wrong thing. I'm just saying that's some of the uh, thought process that goes into should we or shouldn't we include that in the book. I guess last word on that. As you're reading extra biblical texts, and um, my preferred book for that is... Are you here? 
No, that's a field manual. Somewhere in here, I have it. But I have another copy in my house. My preferred book for that is called The Lost Books of the Bible, Great Rejected Texts by Joseph B. Lumpkin. And you can find it on the internet. It's a physical book. Get the physical book. And the reason that's my preferred book of extra biblical texts is because Joseph B. Blumkin is a biblical scholar and there he has written a foreword, an intro to each of the books, the non-canonical texts of the Bible, explaining the historicity of each book. And that's really valuable because some books, for example, Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, First Enoch, which was, in my opinion, is the only actual Enoch, uh, because of, for example, some of the work that Joseph B. Lumpkin has done. Those books have multiple thousands of copies that have been recovered. And of those multiple thousands of copies, they are more or less consistent across each of the copies. And therefore, we can ascribe a higher veracity, a higher historicity value to those books. We have more witnesses. Some books, there's only a handful. For example, Bell and the Dragon uh, attributed to Daniel. There's only two Greek texts, one from the first century BCE and one from about 200 AD. There's two. And so, in the mouths of two or three, let a thing be established. For sure, that's Torah. But a thing is super established when there's 200 or 2,000 or 20,000 or 200,000 copies of it. Right? That's why we know the New Testament, the epistles of Paul and the Gospels, for example. There are tens of thousands of copies and fragments of those writings. So we know that they existed and were in circulation in period, and therefore we can ascribe a very high level of truthfulness to those. Versus some of these other texts that are the great rejected texts, the non-canonical texts, there's only a handful of manuscripts that were fragments of these texts. And therefore, they get a lower score because there's fewer witnesses. And that's why I like that book, The Great Rejected Texts. The Lost Books of the Bible, Great Rejected Texts by Joseph B. Lumpkin because he writes a foreword explaining that for each book that's in, you know, Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, uh, the book of Adam and Eve, Maccabees, um, et cetera, et cetera. Acts chapter 29, um, blah, 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 blah. He explains from a scholarly, biblically researched standpoint how accurate these books are likely to be, who it is that he believes wrote them and who Bible scholars believe that wrote them, and when they were written that's really important because, for example, you get into like 2nd and 3rd Enoch. A 3rd Enoch was written during uh, the medieval period, probably. Enoch went up to heaven with Yah way thousands of years before that. Okay, And there's only a handful of copies. And they all those copies come from the same source. That's really only one witness. See what I mean? So it's important that when you get into the Apocrypha, the non-canonical texts, that you take all of it with a grain of salt because it is, it is less biblically accurate. Not saying it's not divinely inspired, because many of those books are, but it is less biblically accurate. We have fewer witnesses for the veracity of those books. Hopefully that makes sense. But all that being said, do your homework, read not only the entire Bible, or the, well, you should read the entire Bible, but the entire book of Daniel, as well as the Daniel-ascribed non-canonical texts, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, and there's one more that escapes me at the moment. You'll find them, they're out there. You can find them on Google, you can find them in PDF form. Uh, I would prefer it for y'all, as you continue on your walk, that you have a hard physical copy of it that you can refer to. Because... At some point, homie, these lights might go out. These electrons might stop. That's why you should have a physical copy. Jeremiah prophesied that there will be a famine of the word in end times. Not just a famine of food. Guys, you know, we talk a lot about preparedness at this channel. You should do all the preparedness things. 
But the number one prep is being right with your creator, Yahweh your Elohim, by the blood of his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, and then walking in his ways. For this you were called at Messiah, having suffered for your sins, that you might walk in his steps. 1 Peter 2.21 And you don't know how many other people you're going to meet that don't know Messiah yet, that don't know Yah yet. And because of that prophecy in Jeremiah of a famine of the word, um, I stockpile a dozens, maybe near a hundred now, new unopened copies of the Bible and multiple dozens of copies of the Apocrypha and multiple dozens of different reference books about uh, biblical scholarship. Because you might be able to take my iPhone from me. You cannot take this word from me. And that is Daniel 5 and 6. Y'all have a blessed day. Shalom. Hit the button. I'm trying to hit the button. Sometimes these sausage fingers don't do great on this little tiny Babylonian rectangle of death. <laughs>